They were just like your daughters and granddaughters. They didn't have to die. But more often than anyone knows, young women are falling victim to a hidden killer. And there are things you can do about it. Find out more next on Defending Life. I'm Janet Morana, Executive Director of Priest for Life and co-founder of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. Welcome to our Defending Life program. I'm joined today by our Associate Director, Father Dennis Wild. Father, welcome to our program. Thanks, Janet. Great to be back. Yep. Well, as always, we'd like to start with a prayer, and it comes from Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day, written by Father Pavone, our National Director. And today's uh, reflection comes from Cardinal Renato Martino, who was with the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace over at the Vatican. And here's the reflection. The Holy Father speaks of the protection of life as the fundamental realization and respect for human rights. Without that realization, without that respect for the right to life, no other discussion of human rights can continue. Talk is cheap and it often is worse than that. The very thing which we support in speech we sometimes destroy by our actions. So it is with those who fail to protect the unborn. That failure contradicts everything else they say about human rights. Father, fill all nations with respect for life, the foundation of all rights. Amen. Amen. And of course, our viewers can get Pro-Life Reflections for every day. Uh, at Priest for Life by just contacting us or going to our online store. Well, as we said in uh, the outset here, this is about women still dying in, in abortion clinics. And as we know, uh, the whole adage was, uh, you know, no back alley abortions. Well, the difference between the back alley is the doctor took his shingle off the back door and put it on the front door, really. Not much has changed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, women are dying. It's not very well reported in the media, although it is happening. And uh, people need to get this, these facts out, wouldn't you say, Father? Yes, and I think there's certain basic points here that are in those facts. Number one, that abortion is not safe for women. You just alluded to that, and it can be shown, and we're going to show some examples of that. And secondly, the industry itself is rather corrupt, corrupt in what it tells people, corrupt in how it reports things, and how it is before the law. And then finally, at the end of a program, we'll doing some action as to what we will do about it. That's right. Well, when you talk about women have died, of course, uh, there's many women who have been killed uh, in abortion clinics. And if we know about the back alley stuff, even Dr. Nathans had admitted those were made up figures. They trumpeted these big, huge numbers, uh, which was false. And yet they make it sound like, oh, it's safe and legal and everything's fine. But no, these women are dying. And there's uh, some particular cases that we want to highlight uh, today. Uh, very tragic cases, and um, one of them, of course, is uh, Tanya, uh, Tanya Reeves. Uh, she was at a Planned Parenthood uh, in Illinois. Uh, was, that, one, that case got pretty well uh, publicized, I would say, uh, but notice Planned Parenthood was silent on it. They, they, they back off from it, and of course, uh, you know, at the taping of this program, her family is still pursuing uh, what they can do, be do about the fact that their daughter uh, went into that abortion clinic and then never came out. That's right. At 11 o'clock on Friday, she received a second trimester dilation and evacuation abortion at that Planned Parenthood right. in Chicago. And then five and a half hours later, she was bleeding and she was taken by a fire department ambulance finally to Northwestern Memorial Hospital. At that time, a man who was working for 30 years, an emergency room doctor said abortion clinics never inform them about their patient's condition. So there again, they're hiding this whole thing. And, and, and the point is, it, it, it hurts them because it, if they can get that information right away, they, they know that the they patient. can work with them. Right. These delays can have life-threatening implications when dealing with a hemorrhage or infection. And so the opinion at the end of the report, which we've gathered, is uh, the cause of death of this 24-year-old black female, Tonya Raves, is due to hemorrhage resulting from cervical dilatation and evacuation due to intrauterine pregnancy. That's right. It gives that, but then it tells you the manner of death 
accident, but it doesn't say anything about, obviously, how that took place. That's right. And, you know, to point out there, you know, she was transported after hemorrhaging for five and a half hours. What medical professional would allow, would, would allow a patient mm -hmm. with no medical attention to hemorrhage for five and a half hours before calling to transport is because they don't they don't want to show abortion as being anything bad they're hiding it so finally in desperation they, they call the ambulance they have her sent there but they like they, he pointed out the doctor where was her medical chart that went with her right. whenever a patient is transferred like say for example uh, for a nursing home well if the patient has to go from the nursing home to uh, a hospital the nursing home sends the chart and they've called ahead to give them some statistics and data on the, the patient that's being transferred in the emergency so that, like the doctor said there, they can begin treating and helping the person right away. Unfortunately, in Tanya's case, she was too far gone by the time she got to the hospital for them to even help her. It's horrible. And we know of cases where instead of going by ambulance to a hospital, they put them in a car somewhere so they hide the fact that this has taken place or they take them another way. Right. Well, of course, in another case, um, is uh, Jennifer Morbelli, and uh, to me, this this case really, <laughs> I think, was worse worse than ever because this was a mother and father that this child they were expecting, uh, you know, to have the have this baby, this little baby girl. Uh, they had given her a name. They had a baby shower for her and a registry and all that. But when she was beyond her thirtieth week. Her OBGYN told her that the baby was having seizures in utero and expected to have a, a problem once born with seizures. And a termination of pregnancy or abortion was recommended. And can you imagine, Father, she traveled with her, her family, her husband, her mother, to Maryland. And why did they have to go to Maryland? Because they had to seek a late-term abortionist, which was Dr. Carhart. And you know a little bit of background about Dr. Mm -hmm. Carhart. I mean, he worked with Dr. Tiller. That's right. right. And that and whole case in Nebraska, which went to the Supreme Court, and uh, that was the Carhartt versus Stenberg case, which allowed for partial birth abortion in the country. And then it had to be, of course, remanded by the, the, the votes later on. Yeah, and see, this Dr. Carhartt, he's become like a late-term abortion specialist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if some of our viewers say, is this really happening, you know, this late-term abortion? Oh, I thought the partial birth abortion ban. Well, see, he was in, in Nebraska, and he wasn't allowed there because of the new law, which the new law. disallowed it. That's and right. now he goes to Maryland he goes where to it is Maryland. allowed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and people also think that the law signed by President Bush stopped all late-term abortion. Mm -hmm. It just stopped one, type. one procedure, partial birth abortion. It stopped that way of killing late-term babies. But, of course, Dr. Carhartt, heart come up with another method of doing it okay I'm not going to do it by partial birth abortion this is another method I'm going to do so now here this family the Morbelli family travel from Westchester County in New York down to Maryland and uh, what happened there was absolutely horrible and you know what we're going to tell more about this case to our viewers when we come back because there's a lot to talk about here and right after we take this break we're going to come back and tell you more about the horrible horrific death of Jennifer Mabelli and her unborn child in an abortion camp, uh, clinic at the hands of Dr. Carhart, so stay tuned. Not until people saw images of children in coal mines did they enact child labor laws. Not until people saw images of human torture did they rise up against slavery. And now, after seeing these images, what will you do? Priests for Life because America will never reject abortion unless America sees abortion. Call now to learn how you can help. You are looking at the face of an unborn child 25 and a half weeks into pregnancy. This child can be legally killed by abortion in America. As this ad from the Yellow Pages proves, some abortion clinics sell abortions up to 28 weeks. Abortion kills living children whose hearts are beating and whose bodily organs are all in place. Abortion, haven't we gone too far? Welcome back to our Defending Life program where we're talking about a very difficult subject but an important one, that women are still dying in abortion clinics. And before the break, we were talking, Father, about uh, Jennifer Morbelli. Uh, again, she was uh, in her, her final weeks of pregnancy when 
a problem was discovered with her baby. And who knows how that problem would have progressed if that child was allowed to be born. They said the child was having seizures and had some sort of seizure disorder. But, you know, I know by so many cases uh, of people are told that something is happening in utero and the child is born, and after a little intervention of treatment, the child ends up being, living a perfectly normal life, you know. But this couple was offered abortion, you know, and, and I blame the medical community for this. You know, why are they not treating both patients? Instead, because they're afraid of the wrongful birth suits, which are happening, they offer a termination to, to a couple that had a baby registry and were yeah. waiting for this child. So this is crazy. Okay, so they get to Maryland on a Sunday, and they meet Dr. Carhart at his abortion clinic in Maryland, in Germantown there. And, of course, he starts phase one of the procedure. Uh, he gives her the medication that's going to begin to dilate her cervix, and then they go back to the local hotel. They come back to the abortion clinic on Monday for him to see how far along she's dilated and again, give her more medication, and then she goes back to the hotel. Now imagine this, this is going on for days. Tuesday, the same thing. Now we get to Wednesday. By Wednesday, it's time to terminate the pregnancy. And what he does is he injects a, uh, an injection right into that baby's heart of digoxin to stop the baby's heart. So the child is killed, he does this on ultrasound, seek and destroy, and then delivers the dead child. Horrible, horrible procedure. Now. Finishes the procedure and, and he sends her back to the hotel room uh, to rest. And the idea would be the next day they were supposed to travel back up to Westchester County in New York where they live. Well, he then gets on a plane, goes to another state where he performs late term mm -hmm. abortions, which is horrible. And what happens? Uh, she starts to get complications. So what does the mother do? Her parents are with her and her husband. They call the abortion clinic and the doctor's nowhere to be found. And as the night goes on, you know, and she's getting worse and worse. They finally get desperate. They call the emergency room. They get an ambulance. They take her to the hospital. But unfortunately, because of the complications done to her in that late-term abortion, she passes away. And I have here, Father, as you know, the death certificate uh, from Jennifer and her, her unborn child. It's tragic. It's very, true. very tragic. Yes. And this was a girl who married. This was their first child, and she ends up dead. And the story, you know, got reported. Uh, we called the Westchester paper because, uh, coincidentally, Father Pavone had been uh, interviewed, because that's his hometown, uh, by the local secular paper, oh, about a year before. And we called and said, are you aware of this story? So we told them, and guess what? They investigated it. And abortion death investigated ended up on the front page of the paper. Now, this case would have kept quiet, like a lot of them do, and that's why people say, why don't we hear about this? It was fortunate enough, between the work of Priest for Life and Father Pavone, to expose the damage that happened, and also our friend Troy Newman at Operation Rescue shined a, shown a bright, bright light here now. And of course, now the state is, is looking at this case and saying, well, maybe we have to have stricter abortion laws. But uh, it's very, very tragic that this was a case that the, the doctors should have been just done what doctors should do, which is treat both patients, and Jennifer will be alive today. Well, you sure get a great summary of that <coughs> and uh, what is going on, and people moving from state to state and the unregulated uh, situation between states and uh, control of that too That's needs right. to be st strengthened as well. There's another case though that is in, out of Philadelphia that has made national headlines and it is, it is gruesome to say the least. Uh, and when they found out about it and it was taken before the, you know, the <coughs> when it was brought to the case, uh, it, it was a large, uh, a huge summary of this, a 281 page grand jury report. I'm talking about uh, Kermit Gosnell in West Philadelphia, and I, I live not too far from there. I'm about four miles away from there. So this hit the news all the time uh, in Philadelphia. And there was a number of 43 criminal counts against it. They thought they were dealing with some sort of a drug uh, house, but right. they found out something even worse when they opened. They, the investigators got in there and saw this. He also killed uh, Karnan Maya Munger, uh, who was, died of an overly high concentration of Demerol, which today a lot of doctors are using. And seven newborn infants, and those infants, they were terribly killed. They were, um, they were born alive. And then he would slit the, uh, snip the spinal snip cord, the, the cord yeah. in the back, you know. And um, the place was, it had cat urine and it had severed feet uh, of what appeared to be late-term aborted babies. And they were in formaldehyde and they were in jars, almost like a, a trophy of what he had done. A uh, very macabre type of thing. Uh, there were unlicensed workers there. They were, who drugged patients into stupors, spread venereal disease because they reused the same disposable equipment that should have been thrown out. 
they had perforated wombs and bowels and I know this is very uh, disgusting to hear, but it's right. it's what goes on, and we know this case. But the media tried to I indicate afterwards that this was well, this is one one case. Well, guess what? They found out the same thing happened in New Orleans. They found it ha happened in Western Pennsylvania as well. Strict uh, Pennsylvania has laws against all most of all of these things, um, but the the case was that they were not following through it, and so even the the government itself clamped down on it itself to be able to uh, change this. But murder was in this, illegal accessories, people who were not, uh, the wife, his wife Pearl, who was not even- uh, No medical uh, no training. medical training whatsoever. Right. <laughs> and then the former staff members and so on. There were corruptions in there, people masquerading as a licensed physician. It goes on and on. And so, yes, that, that court case was, uh, was a long, a long drawn out one, but it, it at least it highlighted for people to see what is going on in the safe legal, you know, area of abortion, which it is not. That's right. And you know, people might be still scratching their heads and say, this is what really happens in an abortion clinic. And I'm saying absolutely, because they don't follow any of the normal protocols. You know, like for example, in New York State where I'm from, the pets in veterinary clinics can get more. Are, are protected by the laws that are on the books in New York State saying that only a veterinarian doctor can give that dog his rabies shot. Only the doctor, not the assistant. Yet in an abortion clinic, like you said, Gosnell's wife Pearl was helping do things. And we have other testimony from other uh, abortion workers that have come out of there that you know, the secretary or anybody can just step in and assist these doctors who, you know, people think they're like OBGYNs or gynecologists who are specialized, they haven't. Well, I know, Father, we have a lot more to say about this, and we're going to, when we come back after this break, we're going to take a question from our viewers. So stay tuned for Defending Life. When we come back, we're going to take a question from your viewers, and then we're going to also tell you what you can do to help stop this late-term abortion and expose the fact that women are still dying. Stay with us. For so many, the numbers of abortions are just statistics. Now, through this powerful DVD, you can help people see beyond the numbers and begin to have compassion for the real children killed by abortion. Some years ago, Father Frank Pavone conducted a funeral for aborted babies and buried them at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, Alabama. Killed in Darkness, Remembered in Light will bring you on a spiritual and emotional journey and increase your solidarity with these unborn children and their parents. It will help you have hope in the midst of the culture of death and it will help you convince others that abortion is the primary issue of our day. Call our office at 888-735-3448 or go to our online store, ProLifeProducts.org. Thank you. Welcome back to our Defending Life program. And now we're gonna take questions from you, our viewers. So Father, today's question comes from Mark from Minnesota and he writes, someone told me contraception is even a worse evil than abortion. Is that right? Mark, thank you for your question. And it's something people ask a lot. Contraception certainly is what the church calls grave matter. In other words, when one does it knowingly and willingly, it is a mortal sin. So of course is abortion. The two are different, as Pope John Paul II explained in the Gospel of Life, number 13, in the following words. Certainly, from the moral point of view, contraception and abortion are specifically different evils. The former contradicts the full truth of the sexual act as the proper expression of conjugal love, while the latter destroys the life of human being. The former is opposed to the virtue of chastity in marriage. The latter is opposed to the virtue of justice and directly violates the divine commandment, you shall not kill. Then our Holy Father goes on to say, but despite their differences of nature and moral gravity, contraception and abortion are often closely connected as fruits of the same tree. So they are connected, but they are different. And it would be not accurate to say that contraception is worse than abortion. Some try to say this because once conceived, a child exists forever. But contraception keeps the child from being conceived in the first place, okay? Yet this line of thinking risks minimizing the evil of murder and the gravity of the injustice done when you take a life. 
the immortality of the soul does not in any way lessen the gravity of killing the body. In fact, it increases it because you are killing a body infused with a spiritual and immortal soul. This introduces a violation of the rights of the human person that is not present in contraception. Of course, we are talking here about the contraceptive methods that do not kill a human being. Some actions that are called contraception actually cause an early abortion and in that case, of course, they are abortions. Thank you for your question. At any time, you can go to ProLifeQuestions.com to send us more questions. Well, and of course, Father, we have our public outreach department of Priests for Life. While we can only answer one question on each show, we're here every day to answer their questions via phone, snail mail, or email. And, you know, the topic of uh, contraception, of course, uh, that was part of uh, my testimony of uh, going off onto, you know, using contraception for a number of years, not realizing the abortifacient quality. And we do have a brochure of Priests for Life uh, called Contraception Abortion, Fruits of the Same Tree, which they can obtain if they right. want to learn a little bit more. And also we have a marvelous book called uh, The Contraception of Grief, written by Dr. Teresa Burke, right. which has testimonies of people who've gone down the contraceptive road in their grief for doing so, of aborting God's will in their life. So I want to invite our viewers to go a little bit further on this contraceptive issue and get these resources, you know? Right. And then finally, our Priest for Life newsletter, of course, uh, is an, something they can subscribe to absolutely free of charge via snail mail or an email. But getting back to our serious topic of today, uh, women killed in abortion clinics, you know, as you know, it's still a topic that uh, the word still doesn't get out there, right, Father? You had another point? Well, the grand jury report had great impact on abortion policies. It exposed in no uncertain terms the political climate that created these conditions. And that was not just in Pennsylvania, it was around the country. It forced resignations of those who looked the other way. And so this is, this is good. You know, it put down in its, in its finals, so the ancient, rusty, blood-stained medical equipment and so many other things, the dirty, disposable things. I want people to see how bad these places can be. The stench of death and cat urine and so forth. All of these things disgusting and it needed to be uh, taken into consideration and certainly prescribed by law. Right. Well, you know, Father, we have a, a list people can get of women killed in abortion mm. clinics, which I encourage them to use for those who pray outside abortion clinics. They can go to priestforlife.org slash women killed. This will have, it's a double-sided sided sheet they can download. And when they're at, in front, praying in front of the abortion clinics, they can read those names out loud and say, Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, have mercy on them. Remember them in prayer. It's an important tool to raise awareness that women are still dying every day in abortion clinics. Well, thank you, Father Dennis, again for a wonderful, powerful uh, program. You're welcome. Jane. Well, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us on Defending Life. And remember, we also have a Spanish version of this program on EWTN Spanish Channel. And before we go, let me offer you three items. First, there is the will to live, a document to help you and your loved ones make medical decisions in difficult circumstances and to protect you and them from being pressured to do things contrary to moral law. This document enables you to appoint someone you know and trust to speak for you if you cannot speak for yourself and is made according to the laws of each of the 50 states. Father Pavone strongly endorses this document and will send it to you free of charge if you contact us at Priest for Life. Second, we offer mass cards both for the living and the deceased and we will send you as many as you want free of charge to enroll your loved ones in the daily prayers and masses that Father Pavone, Father Dennis, and the whole Priest for Life family celebrate each day. Use these for birthdays, graduations, anniversaries, or other occasions as well, and also at those sad moments when we're saying farewell to someone who's died. Let us know today how many cards you would like, and we'll send them to you free of charge. And third, Pray along with us throughout the year by ordering our new revised pro-life prayer book called In the Palm of His Hand. You'll find prayers for all occasions and liturgical seasons. And remember, you can invite Father Pavone, Father Dennis, myself, and other members of our Priest for Life team like Alveda King to your churches, communities, and pro-life events. Check out our website for details at priestforlife.org. And on behalf of Father Pavone, our National Director, and all our Priest for Life family, I urge you to let us hear from you. Send us your success stories and your questions and comments. And remember, we're not just here to fight abortion, we're here to end it, and we will. Join us again next week on Defending Life.